read by Dale Grothman. A Lesson in Chemistry by Charles B. Corey I took the powder as agreed and sat down to read the evening paper before retiring, with the result that I did not retire at all. I became interested in an article on new explosives with which the government has been lately experimenting, and had nearly finished it, when I heard a voice say to me, Interesting subject, isn't it? I turned and saw, seated on my lounge, a peculiar-looking man. His clothes seemed to be all run in together. You could make out the outlines of the man, but the figure was not clear, sort of foggy, you know. What surprised me most was that I could look right through him and see the back of the lounge. I said to myself, Is this a dream or the effect of the powder I had taken? And I pinched my leg and rubbed my eyes. But although I seemed to be perfectly wide awake, the shape did not disappear. What did you say? I asked. I remarked that the subject of high explosives was decidedly interesting answered the shape i was a chemist when alive but it makes me sad to think how very little i really knew chemistry as well as the other branches of science has made great strides during the past generation since my day but even now they really know very little but i answered it seems to me the high explosives which we now have are sufficiently powerful if we knew how to use them with safety that's it answered the shape now i have a couple of hours to spare and if it would interest you and you care to come over to my laboratory i will be happy to give you one or two points which may prove of value to you i say my laboratory but it really is not mine i use any laboratory that is handiest and i know most of the good ones in the city you see I do not need to have a key to enter a room. That is one of the great advantages we have, as you will discover one of these days. Just now I can get you in very well, because the owner of the laboratory to which we will go is out of town. I will go in first and unlock the door for you. I told him that I should be most happy to accept his invitation. It seemed the most natural thing in the world to be conversing with a ghost and to have him invite me to go to somebody's laboratory and use up his chemicals. It never occurred to me that it might not be considered quite good form. We went out of my room and downstairs, the shadow floating alongside of me in the most friendly manner possible. I could see by the position of his body that he had hold of my arm, but his fingers did not show on my coat sleeve. We went uptown for perhaps half a mile and entered a large brick building in which I noted were various studios. It was dark, but going up three flights of stairs my guide opened a door and ushered me into a large and expensively furnished laboratory, evidently belonging to some scientific man of means and experience. The ghost turned the button on the electric light and then motioned me to a seat. My time, he said, is somewhat limited because I have an appointment with a lady at twelve. But I'll show you what a high explosive really is. And then, if we have time, we will talk of something else. The difficulty in high explosives is not in making them, but in using them after they are made. You create a gigantic power, which you do not know how to handle. The rather modern discovery of how to make liquid air has simplified matters a good deal. When you can make liquid hydrogen in quantities, you will have a still better agent for many purposes. Now, let's take a little of this liquid air. You see, it pours like water. As I happen to know, our absent host has nearly two gallons of it, or had this afternoon. Some of it has evaporated. But as you see, there is still more than a gallon left, and we will not steal much as all we want for our experiment to illustrate to you the greatest explosive which can be manufactured is about as much liquid air as you can hold in a thimble how do you propose to try your explosive here mr i hesitated by the way what is your name oh call me any old name 
It does not matter. Mr. Spook, shall we say? Ahem, a little personal, perhaps, but it will do as well as another. Now, as I was saying, I will show you how to make the most powerful explosive that has ever been invented. It is possible that I did not show as much interest and enthusiasm as he expected, and to tell the truth, I was a little nervous. Spooks do not have the same interest in being careful in their experiments. An accident or two is of little consequence to them, but might be decidedly disagreeable to me. I may have shown something of what I was thinking in my manner, for Spook looked at me keenly. What is the matter? You do not appear interested. On the contrary, I answered, I am deeply so. But do we not run considerable risk in trying such experiments in a laboratory without the consent of its owner? Not at all, not at all. I will use a very small amount of the explosive, and there will be no damage done. Have you attempted to make it before, Mr. Spook? I ventured. Oh, yes, last week. That was a mistake. You see now I know all about it. I didn't then. The explosive was something awful. It blew the building pretty much all to pieces. If I had been alive, I don't believe you could have found a piece of me as large as your finger. They call it spontaneous combustion. However, we won't have anything of that kind tonight. Please don't, I answered. No, I promise you. Now, we will take a little of this red phosphorus. Ordinary phosphorus will not answer. And pour a little liquid air on it. Stir it gently, as you see. Now, if I should let that dry, it would explode at the slightest touch. But we do not want that, and we wish to increase its power. So we add a little chlorine of potassium. Now watch it dry. See the color change to a light red-brown? There, if you should strike that or put fire to it, it would wreck this building as completely as if you'd exploded fifty pounds of dynamite in it. I drew away from the table instinctively. Have no fear. I will not explode it. Now watch me closely. I will ignite a minute quantity, about as much as would make the head of a small black pin or a number four birdshot. See, the rest we will put in a pail of water. There. Now all is ready. Here goes. He lit a match and touched the little brown dot. A tremendous explosion followed, and the wooden table was split into pieces. The sound was so terrific, and the shock so unexpected, that I was dizzy and frightened. Good heavens, I explained. You have broken everything in the laboratory. No, replied the ghost rather shamefacedly. Not so bad as all that, but I'm afraid that I have ruined the table and cracked a few things. However, I will be more careful next time. It is even more powerful than I thought. What do you suppose will be the effect on a warship if struck by a shell containing 100 pounds of that stuff? I answered that she would be destroyed. Destroyed? I should say she would. The largest battleship would be blown to atoms. The spook glanced up at the old-fashioned Dutch clock in the corner of the laboratory. Fine clock, that. Glad I didn't break it with our little racket just now. I see I have nearly an hour to spare. Is there any experiment you would like to try? I said anything would interest me, but I didn't care for any more explosives. I suppose you know how to make diamonds, don't you? I answered that for years men had tried to manufacture diamonds, but practically without success, that as far as I was aware they had only succeeded in making them so small as to be practically of no use commercially, and the expense of manufacture was far in excess of their value. That's all right, answered the spook, but really it is a very simple matter. Here, I will make a diamond for you. He walked across the room to the fireplace, and, taking from the grate a lump of coal about the size of a billiard ball, he laid it upon the table. This, he said, is nearly pure carbon, and as you are well aware, it is practically what a diamond is. Now I will illustrate to you 
how you may make a diamond from this piece of coal which will be as good as any diamond ever found in the mines we will manufacture it instead of letting nature do it we will first place it in this glass bowl and pour over it sufficient liquid air to cover it completely we will let it remain until it is thoroughly cold say at least two hundred below zero there now all we have to do is to heat it and then subject it to a powerful great g hosaphat five minutes to twelve i must go appointment with a lady at twelve but i say old fellow just hold it under a blowpipe until it gets hot just as hot as you can i will be back soon Ta-da! his last words came to me faintly through the window he had already floated out i took the queer-colored piece of coal and began heating it under the blowpipe it did not burn as i thought it would but turned red and then white gradually it seemed to grow larger and larger brighter and brighter until i opened my eyes and found myself in bed with the sun shining full upon me through the open window the end of a lesson in chemistry by charles b corey